Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we have another cardiology lesson on tap. We're going to be learning all about the QT interval. So let's get to it. All right, hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the QT interval. Okay, let's get started. So the goals of today are first of all, to learn about what is the QT interval. Next, we'll talk about the QTC and we'll talk about what are some normal QTC values, what factors can lengthen the QT interval. And then finally, we'll bring us home by talking about when a QT interval is lengthened, what sort of things can go wrong. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what is the QT interval. So the QT interval is a component of the EKG or electrocardiogram. And the EKG is essentially a map of the electrical activity going on in your heart. And so the QT interval comprises the distance from the Q wave, R wave, S wave, and T wave. There's some debate about the best way to measure the QT interval, but a commonly accepted way is through a method called tracing the tangent. And if we draw a tangent line on the end of the T wave, the point where it intersects with the baseline, that is essentially the endpoint for the QT interval. And what the QT interval is demonstrating is the cycle of depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. And in a normal EKG, the QT interval should comprise just less than half of the total cycle, about 40%. So here on the right, this is a diagram of the heart and it's demonstrating the net vector of depolarization. And this maps onto the EKG that we see uh, when we think about where the electrodes are placed. So electrodes are placed around here, the precordial leads. And so as the depolarization comes this way, we see this spike in the EKG, which represents the R wave. And then later we get the T wave as repolarization occurs in the opposite direction. So that produces the T wave. Okay, so now that we know about the QT interval, we're going to talk about the QTC. And this is the corrected QT interval. So C stands for corrected. And the reason we need to calculate the QTC is because the QT interval changes based on heart rate. So at higher heart rates, we'll have a smaller QT interval. And this should make sense because if you have a higher heart rate, your heart's beating faster. So the time between beats is shorter. And because that time is shorter, a single component of the cycle, like the QT interval is also going to be shorter. So we have to do some calculations to essentially normalize the QT interval for the heart rate. One of the main parameters that we use to do this is the RR interval. And so the RR interval is the distance between consecutive R waves, which is essentially one cardiac cycle. And there are different methods to do this. These are some of the formulas on the right. So the most commonly used formula is this so-called Bazet formula. And this is calculated simply by the QT interval over the square root of the RR interval. So this is sort of the simplest calculation, most straightforward and most commonly used. There are also some other uh, formulas used, the Friderisha, Framingham, and Hodges, a bit more complicated, but sometimes used. Newer studies though, have pointed out that maybe this Friderisha and Framingham might potentially be better and that's because at the 30 day sensitivity right here, QTC fry and QTC fra, there are a bit better sensitivity. So that's still up for debate, but one important thing to keep in mind. So we know about QT interval, about the QTC. And so what are sort of some normal values uh, to think about for when we see a measurement? So pre-puberty, normal value is going to be 400 milliseconds plus or minus 20. Then after puberty, it'll be 420, plus or minus 20. And then in a post-pubertal male, the 99th percentile is going to fall at 470 milliseconds. So we can see where this lies. And then in females, the 99th percentile will be 
480 milliseconds. Okay, so this is short, short. So this is showing a normal curve um, of where the normals are. See around 400 millisecond range is essentially what's most common. LQTS is long QT syndrome. Um, so you can see how that's elevated towards the right here. Okay, so what are some of the factors that can lengthen the QT interval? So the first one is electrolyte abnormalities. And in particular, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia. So if we have decreased calcium, potassium, or magnesium, those can lead to lengthening the QT interval. The next one is certain medications, in particular antiarrhythmics and some antimicrobials. Uh, estrogen is another factor, and this is the reason why females have a higher QT interval than males due to uh, the action of estrogen. The next factor is age. So as we age, uh, the QT interval is going to get uh, a bit longer. And lastly, genetics. So sometimes people are born with a certain genetic variant and this can predispose uh, an individual to having an increased QT interval. Now, lastly, if the QT interval is lengthened, so we have a long QT, what are some of the things that can go wrong? So the main concern is what's called polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, or PVT. And when we have this EKG pattern in the setting of a long QT interval, it's called torsade de point. And this is a French phrase, which literally means twisting of the peaks. And so you can see it's characterized here by this undulating pattern of varied ventricular activity um, as it's twisting around the isoelectric baseline of the EKG. And this is thought to be caused by early after depolarizations that sort of precipitated by the long QT interval. So frequently this torsade de pointe is symptomatic and that's because the ventricles are essentially, because of this pattern, aren't coordinating the contraction as well. And so we have an inefficient cardiac output. And when we have inefficient cardiac output, this leads to decreased blood pressure and then can lead to syncope, which is the medical term for fainting or passing out, or sometimes it might just lead to lightheadedness. So often this torsade de pont is self-resolved, uh, but in some cases it can degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. And this is very dangerous, and this is the most serious concern with a long QT interval, because in ventricular fibrillation, or VF for short, the ventricles are in very rapid contraction, uh, but it's very disorganized, and essentially the heart is just quivering. And so your cardiac output is dropping essentially to zero. And this is very concerning because unaddressed, this can lead rapidly to death. So it's really important to know about that risk. But like I said, frequently the PVT is self-resolved. So now that you know about torsade de pointe, you will not be this guy. You will know torsade de pointe is a medical term and not simply a location. <laughs> in France. Okay, so in summary, let's go over what we learned today. First of all, we learned the QT interval is a segment of the EKG, specifically representing a cycle of depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. Next, we learned the QTC is corrected for heart rate. We learned normal QTC values are in the mid to upper 400 millisecond range. The QT interval can be lengthened by a number of factors, including electrolyte abnormalities, medications, estrogen, age, and congenitally. And finally, we learned that a long QT interval can lead to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, PVT, which in the dangerous cases degenerate into ventricular fibrillation, which could lead rapidly to death. 
And that is all. These are my references. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Take care, everybody.